Okay, so welcome back. Today we are talking about sandboxing, virtualization, and application-oriented access controls. So basically, the subject um, is how do we confine applications? How do we control what a program is allowed to do? So you might be used to, like on Windows, normally when you start a program up, it can basically just access, access everything that you can access. Same on Linux, on a Linux system. Usually when you start a program, it can just do anything that you can do on that computer. And that's obviously not great. Because we've got things like vulnerable software, where we've got someone, a, a software author makes a mistake, and that causes security problems. So you can basically take control of that program and make it do things that it's not supposed to do. Um, and also malware, where people are intentionally creating software to do something malicious. In either of those instances, we have some software that's running with your identity on your computer, doing stuff that you don't want it to do. So this subject is all about how do we stop that from happening? How do we restrict the damage that these programs can cause? So if you remember, we were recently talking about access control, which is mostly focused on how we control what a user is allowed to do. So we can say that this file can only be accessed by this user. Or this user is allowed to read this file or write to this file. Yeah, so it's very closely related to the idea of sandboxing. In fact, you can, all, you can actually go as far as to say sandbox, sandboxing is just a type of access control. But normally when people talk about access controls, they're talking about restricting what users are allowed to do on a system. So it's still not quite enough to protect ourselves. Because if all the programs on our computer are running as us, then the access control is not actually providing that much protection. It stops a program from maybe running as another user. So if we're a program that we're running, say I'm running Adobe Reader, someone sends me a malicious PDF document, they take control of Adobe Reader, then they can access all of my files. They can't access, they can't change the operating system because I might not be root but they can access all of my own personal documents. So that's not really good enough, right? So um, you know, the, the most common operating system um, approach to access control is discretionary access control, or DAC. And that's where the users get to control what other users are allowed to do on a system. So any resources that, that you own, you can specify who else can access those resources. Um, but other types of access control include mandatory access control and rule-based access controls, which we did talk about last week. <clears throat> but the problem is there's just an insufficient level of protection against programs that are running because they are running with an identity of a user. But they're not always acting in the user's best interests. So there have been a number of solutions to this problem that have been proposed over time. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about, some of these different solutions to this problem. So we can run applications in sandboxes, and those can either be isolated, where we basically take a program and just put it in its own little cage and just say, you're only allowed to access these specific things, or you can do something more complicated where you try and specify rules about what the program's allowed to do. So we specify exactly what this program is allowed to do. So yes, you're allowed to access that file, but no, you're not allowed to access that file. Yes, you're allowed to talk to the network, but no, not in that way. And it, the rules can get quite complicated. So just starting off by talking about isolation-based sandboxes. Um, the, the simplest way is, yeah, we create a separate environment for a program to run in. And any program inside that environment can just access the resources that are within that sandbox. So some examples of that is if you've got a system level um, sandbox. So we basically create a complete operating system that is running. So an example of that is if we use virtualization. Um, so for example, you know, in the labs, you, we make a lot of use of things like VMware, Player, and VirtualBox, and things like that. They're essentially an entire operating system running on top of the operating system that we're using. And 
you can use that as a security defense, right? If you're not sure about a program, you could basically create an entire system level virtual virtual machine. You have an entire copy of Linux or Windows on there just to run the one program, for example, if you're not sure about it, or to play all your games or to do all your internet banking or something. So you can do that and that restricts the kinds of things that can go wrong in that virtual machine. Unless unless the um, if there's a malicious code, it is sometimes possible for it to escape a virtual machine, but it's fairly rare, but it, it has happened in the past. Uh, so there have been some vulnerabilities patched in Zen recently, XEN um, hypervisor, and they, uh, I think the entire, which cloud is it? I think it's, um, is it the Amazon? Um, like cloud infrastructure, they had to basically everyone that had any virtual machines, they all had to reboot because they had to update the version of Zen that was on there, I think, if I'm rem remembering that correctly. It was a few months ago now. Um, so with virtualization, you've got a hypervisor, um, also known as a um, virtual machine monitor, and that can multiplex hardware. So basically, it can share one piece of hardware with multiple virtual machines. And um, you can have hardware level virtual machines, which is where the virtual machine basically acts as though it's on a computer. So sometimes the virtual machine might not even know it's a virtual machine. It's just running and it accesses the hardware just like it would normally. But the hypervisor basically steps in and gives them access to the resource and shares that resource. So say, for example, you've got a hard drive, you can have multiple um, you know, virtual machines accessing that same hard hard drive, for example, or CD ROM and things like that. CD ROM sounds really old fashioned. DVD drive, I should say. Uh, Blu ray. Um, hardware based emulation is um, where the, um, the guest OS doesn't need to know it's virtualized. So, some examples of that are VMware and VirtualBox. And it might use some para-virtualization, but it's mostly um, hardware emulation. Para-virtualization is where um, the guest knows they're in a virtual machine. Um, and then it can use the API provided by the virtualization. So it acts slightly differently than a normal operating system, but the result is it can be a lot faster. So um, for example, if we use, talk about Zen or user mode Linux, these are para-virtualization systems. So the kernel of the operating system, it knows it's in a virtual machine. So rather than pretending like it's actually talking to a real hard drive, for example, and just using the normal you know, drivers to access a hard drive, it can directly talk to the hypervisor and just say, you know, give me this file. So it's a bit, it's a bit quicker, it can be more efficient. Um, cubes. It's quite an interesting one. So this is a research project, but if you like, you can actually download the um, the Cubes operating system and install it. Um, and it's very clever. Basically, what it is is it's this distribution of Linux that is highly focused on using virtual machines to try and protect you against malicious code. So you know how I was saying before, you could have a, a virtual machine for doing your banking and a virtual machine for playing games. Well, this basically has the, all of that baked into the operating system so that when you launch an application, you can kind of configure it to launch into the virtual machine. And it, I think it has like, it colors the um, taskbars based in which, which virtual machine it's running inside of. And it has tightly controls any interaction between, say, a banking um, application and a game because they're running in separate virtual machines. Yeah. Well, there is definitely an overhead with virtual especially hardware based virtualization it is quite a lot of work to do that um, but it, it does some clever things. So it, it um, cubes, for example, will try and um, reduce the overhead of having multiple copies 
So rather than just having like distinct copies of virtual like entire operating systems, it does some clever things to access the same part of the hard drive unless it tries to write to it and things like that. Um, so it does try and minimize that overhead. Um, but there is definitely some overhead. Having said that, in the labs, I was uh, before this year started, I was testing the new hard hardware because we got a, all the computers were replaced before this year started, before this academic year. I replaced all the computers in the labs. And just as an experiment, I say I was wanted to see how many virtual machines each of those computers could handle because obviously we do have a few labs where you've got sometimes like four virtual machines open at once in order to do a lab exercise. Um, and it ran 10 like fine, like quite smoothly. So, so you know, if you if you think about it, how many um, actual virtual machines do you need to separate out these things? So that the the way that cubes works is there's like a banking one, I think, and there is like work um, and games and something else. So, you know, I it on modern hardware, it should handle it all right. Is it, um... It just looks like multiple windows open. Yeah. 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 The um, yeah. So you you can try that out. It's quite interesting. Um, it's quite a nice idea. Very hard to run that in a VM though. <laughs> so like, oh, that that sounds good. I would like to give give you that to play with in one of the um, you know in today's lab, this week's lab. Uh, so I tried installing cubes into a VM, but I guess you can see why that might not be that easy. Um, so I, I didn't get it working, and it wouldn't uh, couldn't get it installing on the lab computers. Um, but it shouldn't be too much trouble to dual beat it on your own PC if you wanted to have a look at it. Um, there's all kinds of uses you can use for virtualization. Um, so you can you know separate things out, you can isolate them. Um, obviously. As we discussed last semester when we were talking about backups, redundancy, and cloud computing, you know, all the cloud infrastructure, cloud is basically virtualization um, used to make things more efficient. So, and running on someone else's server. But if you look at a lot of the cloud technology, it's the ability to have lots of virtual machines lots of virtual services, be able to migrate them between servers, have lots of independent hardware from you know, the actual things that you're trying to host and you can do all sorts of clever things. So it's amazing, there's an amazing technology. Um, uh, but you know, can, can anyone think of any disadvantages of using virtual, actual like hardware-based virtualization for security? Yeah. What? What? Are, what's that then? Well, from this point of view, you know, it's not going to store things um, directly onto the computer. It's going to be virtualized again. If that virtual machine runs like this, you can essentially shut down the data from. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if it was just a single system like dual boot system, that's just saves up to different parts that you're going to be logging, then logging, etc. But virtualization may not do that. Yeah. So from a forensics point of view, that y you can. You, there, so there's two type, There's a few types of virtual machines, but you get ephemeral virtual machines, which is where after the virtual machine finishes, it just the state disappears. Um, but remember, all of this is on a computer. So there's a computer or multiple computers running these virtual machines. It's possible that you leave forensic evidence on all of the computers that's a part of your cluster. Like it, they, they're real hard drives involved. Um, but if it stays entirely in RAM, then yeah, it might just disappear and be gone forever. But in a lot of cases, that's not true. And what happens is it just that any changes to the virtual disk, so the virtual hard drive, gets written to a store somewhere. So there is a file that represents the hard drive, and it will still contain the forensic evidence. And in some ways, it's actually easier to do the forensic evidence because you can just copy the virtual machine. And that's loads easier than you know the normal process of collecting evidence from a computer um, because it's just the hard disk image is already a file, so you just copy it off um, rather than having to you know use special software like NK Safety K Imager or whatever to actually 
get the hard drive into a file that you can process. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely um, both from a forensics point of view, it does make things interesting. And possibly it's an area where there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of, you know, for forensics to catch up to all the cloud-based things, you know, that could be, you know, potential work to, that still needs to be done. Um, any other, like, disadvantages of using full hardware level virtualization to protect yourself? I think the main one that I'm trying to fish for is just how difficult it is. Like, usability-wise, if you've got an entire operating system, like usually, you know, Cubes is nice, but it's probably not, you know, unfortunately, probably not at the point where you'd want to use that as your everyday computer. Um, so if you are using Linux or Windows and you want to use loads of different applications and things, it's a lot of work to maintain all these different virtual machines just each one might just be containing one application that you don't trust um, so you know can we use hardware emulation to confine an individual application yeah sort of so we can have an entire operating system just to have one program running in it um, but that can be quite difficult from a workflow point of view also if, say for example you have a operating system for editing a file if you're going to then open that with a different program to view it if they're in separate virtual machines that's a nightmare so you're copying out of one virtual machine into the next you know do you have shared folders in which case you know how much protection is it providing uh, yeah so it's quite it's it's complicated but there are definitely advantages so the place where it excels is server. If you're if you've got a server, you got multiple people with separate accounts that you need to host, virtualization is amazing. You can do this sort of stuff. You can use these technologies to do that really well. If we're talking about an end user's computer, it's all just it's not quite that easy to use. Container-based sandboxes is a similar kind of thing, except that it shares the kernel. So you have um, some examples of things like chroot and jails and um, Linux containers. And it is usually like a whole copy of an operating system. But instead of having like a whole other kernel running on the computer, it shares the same kernel. So if you kind of imagine it like you've got a Linux system running, if you're using hardware-based virtualization, you would then have a hypervisor running and then an entire other copy of Linux running underneath that or on top, depending on how you want to draw it. Um, if you use container-based virtualization, instead what you have is a Linux running and then just another Linux running on top of that and it doesn't have all that overhead of virtualizing all the hardware and there's not like a whole other copy of the kernel running. It's just the kernel knows there's a container and that container has a different view of the system. So um, can you guys think of any advantages or disadvantages to that approach? It sounds like it'd be easier to break out of that. Kind of easier to break out of? Yeah. That is definitely true. Um, if you find a flaw in the kernel, for example, Bingo, you've just broken out and you can now see everyone's containers, you can now see the entire operating system outside of that. Um, you, there's less layers there, so rather than being breaking the kernel and then the hypervisor and then the next level down kind of thing, you, it's just one thing to break. That's true. Um, but if it's done right, if it is done right, it's much easier to manage. It's way faster um, than running, you know, a hardware-based virtualization. So that's why. Uh, has anyone here heard of Docker? I just see a show of hands if you've heard the term Docker. No one. <laughs> so Docker is um, very, very popular at the moment in um, certain circles. So if you are a um, 
system administrator who provides like hosting services, Docker has become very popular. Basically what Docker is, it's this, but with more layers of ease of use basically. It's designed so that you can just fire up. Uh, you can say, give me an Ubuntu system with this software on it and, and Docker will just do it. There it is. Um, so it's like this automated way of generating these container-based um, sandboxes, these container um, containers. So they become really popular because you can have a server and where you would use, if you use full virtualization, you might you know, have X number of VMs that you can run. If you use container-based, you can have like twice as many, um, you know, websites hosted on that one server kind of thing. So it's very popular for that one reason alone. But then the security thing, there have been a few security issues along the way. But, um, you know, it's a, it is a cool thing. So the difference is it's the kernel itself that does the security. So the kernel is knows that there are containers and it decides what each container gets to see. With the container-based, is it just applications or do you want these systems? The, the very clever thing about Docker, for example, is you can say, I want this application and it needs this operating system and it will spin it all up, get it ready, which is similar in a way to Vagrant, if you've heard of that, which is like designed for developers that you can basically spin up virtual machines and it, it like uses Puppet, which is this automation framework for server um, management, and um, which is what Lewis's final year project is based on. Um, but it can spin up virtual machines. Um, I just thought that if um, it talks to the Linux kernel directly, would you be able to run a Windows system on that? No, you can't. So yeah, so that's another um, limitation, is that you can't have like a Windows um, I think they're working on that with Docker because like Microsoft were a bit worried about how popular Docker is at the moment and it does make it hard to run like Windows on a Linux server, for example, as opposed to like hardware based virtualization where it's not an issue. Um, so you can't, but what you can easily do is have different distros of Linux on the same system. So what you can have is because the kernel is the same across different distributions, more or less, like similar enough that it can run um, like this different user space tools. So you've got the kernel running, say you've got your OpenSUSE system running um, with the OpenSUSE kernel and then you can spin up, basically you can create like a Fedora, an Ubuntu, Arch, um, you know these different versions of Linux and they are runners like they look like entire Linux systems but they're just sharing the one system uh, and the one kernel. <clears throat> CH root is the main way that that's done on Linux systems. So the underlying technology in something like Docker is CH root, and it's a system call that's available on Unix systems, and you can basically change the root directory for a process and all its children. So you can say, start up a new program. Um, so start up Apache, for example, um, and put it in a ch root here and you point at a place on the file system and under that directory you can have like an entire copy of linux sitting there so you'd have the root directory of so you would have your own file path and then at some point you've got this whole copy that looks like uh, it's a root directory with everything inside it and you say make that this program's root directory so then when that program looks at root it just sees what's in there in, inside that directory, it doesn't see the actual what's outside of that, and what that what that's known as is its namespace. So it see it's like in programming, where you've got variables that if it's outside the scope you can't see it. Um, it's kind of like that. So you've specified the namespace for that application for that process, and it can't see anything outside of that. Um, there's a program on Linux called chroot, which you can use to launch any program into a chroot jail. Um, but um, only root can perform a chroot, but it should change its identity as soon as possible because root can also escape a chroot pretty much very easily. So it, it only is helpful if you start as root, do the chroot, drop root's ability and become a normal user and then 
as long as it doesn't find some way to become root again, uh, it's relatively, um, it works kind of thing. If uh, you were rooted at CH root, can you just do dot dot and it'll go up to the... It's not quite as straightforward as that, but you can escape out. Um, dot dot won't like just yeah. traverse back because it sees itself as now this is root, but um, it is possible to get out. Um, some things aren't mediated. So if you remember when we were talking the other week about all the design um, principles of des secure design, so the things that you can do to be secure, one of those is complete principle of complete mediation. Um, so that everything that you try and access um, has to be go through the security um, kernel. That does not apply to CH routes because there are certain things like networking doesn't matter if you're in a CH route or not, you can still access the same network stuff. It doesn't, you can see all the all the processes that are on that system, even ones that aren't in a CH, CH route jail. So it's not um, really designed originally to do what we're doing now, but that's why things like Docker add a whole bunch of extra stuff on top of that core feature set that CH route provides. Um, and there are some other systems like FreeBSD jails, um, that kind of solves some of those problems and, and does things a little bit better. So a copy on write sandbox is um, when you have a program, it can see everything on your computer and it can access all your files. But if it ever tries to write to a file, that get that as far as it can tell, it worked. It's changed the file. But it actually, those changes are just stored separately for that program. So for every other program's perspective, that file didn't change. Um, so that is um, quite effective if there's software that you're not sure whether you trust it, but you really want to just use it kind of thing. Um, and some of those kinds of systems, when you finish using the program, you can vet, like you can look at all the changes it made and approve them or like discard them or keep them in the sandbox. So if you are a Windows user, heaven forbid, I highly recommend Sandboxy. It's really good. So this Sandboxy and some other systems like Pastures and Alcatraz do similar things. But if, you, if you're using a Windows system and say, for example, you wanted to run some program that you got off some dodgy website, you're not really sure if you trust that program or not, that is probably all right. So for example, um, I don't know, you download something off some, yeah, just off some software download site or something. And you're just not quite sure about it. If you run that in Sandboxy, you can just use the program. It'll just work. But then at the end, you can actually review what it changed. And you can even look at all the registry settings that it changed as well and just decide. If, you, if it all looks fine, you might say, all right, I'm not going to run, bother running it in the Sandbox next time. Um, but it just keeps the changes that it makes isolated. Um, so yeah, I do highly recommend recommend that if you are using Windows. Would Sandboxy be good for um, like, uh, testing malware? So yeah, it's changes. yeah, Asus, yes, you can use it for that. Um, so if you've got some malware that you want to analyze, you can basically do like dynamic mal malware analysis with sandboxes and things like that. Um, I guess the only if a program is working really hard to escape the sandbox, again, you have to rely on the fact that it's programmed well, and it it, it probably is. Um, but also, if you're... So yeah, yes, you could do that. Uh, Self-contained applications. So a different approach to this same problem is where you just have a program that can't do anything without asking permission. So things like Java applets, um, if they're done right, um, uh, which has kind of become less popular, but back in the 90s was one of the main ways of creating dynamic websites, but I guess we don't really see them anymore. Things like Silverlight, which again is starting to die off. Flash, thank God it's disappearing. What a horrible mess. Um, and Java native code. So in all of these examples, if like a Flash, if you have a Flash game or app or whatever, and you go and you use it, if uh, Adobe has coded it correctly, which they don't have a very good track record of doing, um, then 
when a Flash game, for example, tries to access a file, you, it needs to ask you a permission, basically. And usually it would be because you've said open a file and then you browse that file and click on it, um, which is known as a power box, which is where your interaction is kind of giving that application permission to access something. And it's the same with like Firefox, if you're on a website and you click the upload button and then you select the file, that website couldn't just access all of your files. It's only because you've said, yeah, I want it to be able to open this file. And that act of clicking it um, basically gives it the authority to access that file. Um, so that's that dialogue that pops up is known as a power box. Um, so the, the great thing about this is that there's no ambient authority. So you don't, that program doesn't just automatically get access to everything. So that, that is a nice thing from a security perspective. Um, but it doesn't translate to um, applications that aren't built that way. So you can't then just apply this to you know existing systems. But it you know it is a quite quite a nice way of doing um, security. So what we just discussed is a whole um, bunch of different isolation based approaches to sandboxing. And all of these systems are great for shared servers and isolating completely separate systems. But some of the disadvantages are redundancy. So in a lot of cases, especially if you're talking about virtual machines, using if you're using something like VirtualBox or VMware Player or Workstation or whatever, you usually that means you've got entire copies of offering systems. So if you just wanted to protect your, um, you know, some dodgy program that you ran, downloaded from um, BitTorrent or whatever, and you wanted to be not be scared of the fact that you're running some dodgy software. Every time you did something like that, you create a whole new operating system. That's a huge amount of redundancy that you've got going on there. Not only every file that makes up Windows or Linux that you've got copied into it, but the overhead of having to manage all of that. So if you now have to basically keep all of them up to date, have you applied all the security patches to like all of these different versions of Linux and Windows and everything, and it becomes, it can become ridiculous. Um, you might decide, well, actually, I've only got stuff that I don't care about in this VM, and therefore I'm not going to bother to keep it up to date. Is one approach, but you know, then you're just making that particular VM a soft target, and yeah, I mean, something to consider. Um, so there's definitely some um, workflow issues where you've got multiple virtual machines, and often you want to be able to access files across them. So this alternative solution to that kind of system is to use a rule-based sandbox, which where you can control what each application is allowed to do separately. So you say, this application is allowed to do this, this application is allowed to do this set of things. And we launch the program into a sandbox which can enforce exactly which files are accessible. So examples of that is system call into position. So um, you guys remember what a system call is? Uh, uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so a program makes a request to the kernel. So can I please open a file? It's a good example. Um, with system call into position, we've got some extra software that runs and actually looks at each of those requests to the kernel and steps in and basically says, whoa, no, I'm going to stop that before it even goes to the kernel. Like, no, in, uh, or yes, you know, let, let certain things through. And so it's basically a filter on the system calls. Um, and it's kind of experimental, I guess, would be an, a nice way of putting it. There's, there, there was a lot of research on this, uh, probably about... Um, was that as long as a decade ago? Yeah, a while ago. There, there was a lot of research and lots of different systems were proposed. And um, some clever things like Mapbox tries to do things that slightly, slightly more intelligently, like where you can find programs based on classes of behavior. So you say this is a file editor, and it will try and um, specify the system call interposition rules based on that fact. Um, but the disadvantage of system call interposition is just that system calls can be really complicated. Um, there's just this, there can be just opening a file, you know, involves a few system calls. You know, accessing the network 
involves, I don't know, like loads of system calls and they all interact in subtle ways sometimes. And if you've got a filter on top of that that's separate to the kernel, there's just so many ways that it can go wrong from a security point of view. Um, so another way to go about it is basically to, um, rather than launch them using a separate piece of software into this protected sandbox, you just bake it all in so that it's built into the operating system, for example. And it might still be called a sandbox because people are um, easily confused. Um, so for so, for example, you might say the Android sandbox, but you know we're talking about a level of access controls, basically. But there are rule-based access controls that go to the point of looking at what application it is when it makes this decision. So often they're mandatory. So in other words, the user has no choice. The policy is defined by an administrator. Um, and when one application starts another, a policy, a policy transition may occur. Um, which changes the policy that's applied. So, for example, when one program starts another program, that other, the second program that's running might have a separate set of rules that apply to it than the first program that was running. Um, so, one um, approach to this is course-based rights. So, for example, Android, we'll talk about that later, and Bit, Bitfrost, where we basically say, yes, you can access the camera, or you can access GPS, or you can access the internet, you know, you've had those big chunks of rights that you can give an application. Um, another example of that is Linux capabilities. Um, so as we know, root is like this all-powerful user that can do all kinds of crazy stuff on a Linux system or a Unix system. So if you are root, you can do everything. It's kind of like, you know, what you probably think at the moment. But using Unix, uh, Linux capabilities, it is possible to drop permissions from root. So you can be a root user and say, I don't need the ability to um, read raw network access, or that's all I need, and drop every other root permission. So that is um, you know, a nice way around the problem of root being ridiculously powerful. So you can have um, someone running as a process running as root, and the process opts to drop permissions, or you can drop it before uh, while you're starting the process. So there, yeah, there's some. Um, clever things clever things there. Um, a disadvantage of using these course based rights is not everything can be represented that way. So for example, do I want to be able to access this particular file? Well you can't just you know you can't break that in down enough for it to be these course um, base based um, rights. Um, but it is quite good. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Uh, Place say root control permission, does that mean if someone did sudo, then it would stop root from doing certain things? Yeah, so for example, you might um, uh, say, for example, I, well, the ping program, for example. So the way ping works is usually it runs a set UID. So as we talked about last week, I believe, if you are running set UID root, that means that you run with all of Root's permissions. And that's just so you can ping someone on the network? That, that's something wrong with that, right? But it's because no normal user is allowed to get raw access to the network card. So ping needs that extra permission, and therefore we use set UID. If we do things really well, we can also use capabilities so that we basically don't get any of Root's other stuff. So if there was a programming mistake in ping, you couldn't then just automatically get root access to the computer. You would just you would have you would be root, but all you could do would be access the network. Um, so it's like a way of breaking down root's root's all powerfulness um, to stop the problems associated with that. So I should say different word for root that's block privileges and. Root without uh, no. <laughs> Super root and um, neutered root. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so Linux capabilities. So normally you've got two types of users. We've got privileged and unprivileged user. So either your UID is zero or it's not zero. And if your UID is zero, then you bypass basically all the kernel submission checks. So when the kernel was go like looks at the security information to make the decision, if you're root, it's like yeah, fine, go for it. Capabilities divide those privileges. 
So, um, and that includes cap CH root. So, for example, the ability to, to call CH root is a capability. And if you only needed the ability to call CH root, you could drop all the other capabilities. Or if you never wanted to be able to do CH root, you can drop that capability. Um, so capabilities can be granted to or removed from individual processes. So programs can be programmed to drop capabilities. Um, they can either delete the capabilities from its list or it can temporarily disable them and then enable them again. Um, program files can have capabilities attached so that it kind of happens automatically. So you say, when this program starts, I want it to have these capabilities. Um, but you can also remove capabilities from an entire system using capability bounding sets. So um, you can, for example, remove the ability for kernel modules to be loaded after system starts, which would be quite nice from a security point of view, because if someone can load a kernel module, they can essentially subvert all of the, of the controls that are in place. Um, so that you can help prevent rootkits, for example. So let's have a look at the time. I think that's a good place to wrap it up, and I will. Um, we can pick up here uh, next week after Easter.